welcome all of you. Thank you for being here on this uh, semi-breve 2021 talk. I beg you please to give a very warm welcome to Flora, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Yin Wong. I am, so please. <laughs> She's just released um, a book this year called Liturgy. Last year, she had this very acclaimed record, and for the right reasons, I'm guessing, um, called Holy Palm. Um, and she's just premiered yesterday this, this, this piece at a very beautiful place um, in what we were just calling when we were talking off uh, before, just minutes before this started, uh, like a marathon. You know, athletes train for marathons. Did you train for this? Um, I can't say that I did, to be honest. Um, I'm very used to like my live sets being very short, like 25 minutes, half an hour. Um, so it was quite like mind bending to try and work out how to make three hours um, a somewhat engaging experience. Um, but I don't know, I feel like I had a lot of different kind of elements to the set to help, at least to stop myself from getting bored. Okay, okay. So, you know, I, I was reading your interview with the quietest before coming here. Um, first thing that struck me was your mention of a very early discovery uh, that, and these are your words, there's another layer of things to the world. I think you are referring to the spiritual realm. Um, well, as Cinema and, you know, fantastic literature has shown us recording sound is one way to open up pathways to that invisible dimension, right? Yeah, I think I agree. I think, I mean, there's lots of senses that will pick up different things that might be overlooked by another. And I think, I mean, that kind of quote is just probably me thinking about like how I viewed the world since young and there were probably experiences that I had that made me feel that there was something else but I wouldn't say that I'm a religious person or a spiritual person as such even um, but I don't know I think also those things usually come to those that believe right so it's kind of yeah. like if you're open to it you're more likely to receive it we, we, we don't have that kind of, I mean, I have always talked about how the word record, which we in Portugal translate to disco, album, but it always, it also means registro, it always means um, a document that is archived. So, when, it, when we are listening to these old recordings, we are actually listening to ghosts. So we are listening to spirits. Isn't that it? Yeah, I think, I mean, also, I remember going to a talk um, about a writer who wrote a book called Rorschach Audio, where um, there were like various experiments where people did a lot of like recordings in various rooms, and they do pick up certain sounds that yeah. they weren't really Maybe they didn't hear them whilst they were in the room, but the recording would have picked it up. Yeah. And also like certain things like how watching someone say a certain word, but hearing them say a different word, you start to hear what, they're, what it looks like they're saying rather than what they are saying. So it's kind yeah. of like these misguided signals that are quite interesting. Um, so I think, I mean, that's kind of what I wanted to do a little bit in the record, is like put together all these different recordings from really disparate places from the past and different memories for me come up and then I'm sure they'll trigger different kinds of memories for people that, you know, have it correlate to something else. There's been an amazing production of science fiction about 
tapping into people's memories. Mm -hmm. But that's actually what the recordings are, aren't it? Yeah, yeah. So wh 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 when you press rec on a recording device, you are actually saving memory. Yeah, exactly. I wasn't. I mean, I never really like intentionally made field recordings for the sake of using them for music. It was the sake of a memory. Like a diary. Yeah, kind of. I mean, I think at the time I didn't really think I was doing that, but yeah. it was just kind of like appreciating a moment or appreciating a thing that I can hear. Do you listen back to those recordings and? Are you struck by things you didn't hear the first time when you were doing those recordings? Yeah, for sure. I think like when I was putting together, um, so the, the C and D side of that record, um, yeah. I initially stitched that together for a project for Summers House Studios because they asked me to make an audio commission, and it was kind of based around radio signals and this idea of like an otherworldly experience. Um, and so I was kind of, when I was going through all my old recordings to put together for this, um, I was really emotional. I was really like, mm. I, was, I was crying a lot. I was feeling very, you know, there's a lot of heavy things there um, from, you know, nothing, you know, it's just like <laughs> some steps in the snow or some wind or something. But, you know, I know why I recorded it mostly and I can remember certain things and it's quite, it's very nostalgic and very like, yeah. We have the, this, I would say, untranslatable uh, Portuguese expression that goes quem nunca, né? like who has never cried when listening to an old recording of something or, you know, just watching an old photograph or an old film mm. or whatever. So. Can we tra talk a little bit about travel now? Because um, from what I've been reading and studying about your case, it's an important part of your creative process. Um, do you think that you travel to look for the unknown or new things, or just to make yourself, you know, available to the unexpected? Um, I don't. I mean, I think a lot of the, the travel that I've done has always been for work. So it's never like, um, like I come from a, a working class background. Like I grew up in London in like in the center. And I think I always craved like a lot of activity um, and different experiences. But I mean, I wouldn't say that I couldn't necessarily afford to go traveling or have a gap year or anything like that. But I mean, I started working as a journalist um, mm -hmm. at a magazine. We'll talk Spider about Street. that a little bit later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and then so for that, I ended up traveling a lot. And then I started DJing, and I would travel a lot for that. So generally, um, anything I've been kind of taking in terms of like photographs or videos or recordings, it's just kind of been a byproduct of like being in these places. I didn't like go to do something as such. Mm. You know, when talking to friends about traveling, um, they are always interested in telling me about how it is to go, but I'm always very curious about what they bring back from those travels, you know? People are like, I went there, I did this, I photographed that, I experienced that, but I'm always interested in talking about, okay, but the moment you arrived home, the moment you returned, what do you think remained of those travels that, you know, it doesn't fit in your iPhone or whatever? Uh, it's not about what you photograph, it, it's what I'm, I'm guessing, it's, it's, it's about what, what you keep inside, isn't it? Yeah, I think a lot of the time, like, when you're somewhere else, it's just like really different or like, Sometimes it takes a while to process that as well. So I think it's only when you return home that you realize that you've been somewhere or that you then kind of start to understand where you've been, mm -hmm. even if it's a short amount of time. So I guess it's more of an internal thing that you keep rather than a physical thing, as you say. And it, 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 
you don't always travel for pleasure. I mean, it's also a very emotional process where sometimes you get to carry back a very heavy load, doesn't it? Yeah, I think, I mean, <clears throat> there, there probably was like, you know, a time when I started to get a little bit complacent about traveling. Mm -hmm. um, and it felt a little bit like, you know, DJs are always complaining about airports and hotel rooms <laughs> yeah. and stuff. And I think it does get kind of repetitive. But, you know, I think if you take a step back, especially some, you know, when something happens like the pandemic and everyone is grounded, I think that was a really valuable time for everyone to feel like, you know, you can't really take the world for granted. Like you have to really go and see it. That was a very special time that we all have just very recently went through. Um, those of us who were used to, to traveling, we were so suddenly deprived of a very important activity to our very own self-definition. How did you deal with that? You being grounded, uh, lockdown, uh, you know, borders closed, um, airport, hustle to just being able to get into an airplane? Yeah, I mean, it was really, I mean, obviously for a lot of reasons, aside from that, it was just like a super intense time. And, you know, I lost my job um, because of the pandemic, because um, I was working in events and, you know, everything shut down very kind of last minute, but also really overnight in London. Um, and I think I was kind of, I was okay with um, with lockdown at mm. first because I felt like you know what it's necessary, and this is what needs to be done, and this is how we're dealing with it until we can find a better way. Um, and I think it's just obviously mentally it becomes very draining, especially like I don't know. I always feel like I generally I can't really stay in the same place for like a month without like freaking out and feeling yeah. very like cabin fever. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so I, I know that I, I was just mentioning those people who bring back from the travels the, the, the photos on, on, on their smartphones, but did you find yourself going, you know, scrolling through the, the, the photos or just remembering those, those moments and, you know, just wanting to get the feel, that, that feeling back? Um, I, don't, I don't think I did, actually. I think I spent a lot of lockdown making things and doing okay. new things and trying to be present. Um, and I think that's kind of what got me through. Like, it was kind of like this kind of global, like, time out. So it was kind of like, okay, you can't work, you can't play gigs, you can't do this, so what do you do? So I was like, gardening <laughs> and like, growing vegetables and knitting. Making and bread? I didn't, <laughs> I didn't actually make bread, but yeah. I really love baking, so I was already, I was already baking a lot. Um, so yeah, like, you know, just these kind of like homely, <coughs> nice things that are very chill. And I feel like I was learning a lot in that process as well, like being very hands-on with stuff, um, rather than like dwelling on stuff that I knew I couldn't have. Yeah. So, um, your work manifests itself through different media. Um, you released an acclaimed album last year, Holy Palm. I hope you all have heard it. And uh, you have just published a new book, Liturgy. What would you say connects both works? Um, obviously, Liturgy is the you know, organization of rituals that try to connect humans to the idea of holiness. Kind of like music is the organization of sound, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, really, I, I don't really see myself as a creator of things. Like, I don't see myself as a creative person. Okay, uh, that's interesting. I see myself more as, like, I like putting things together and, like, bringing things together and, like, curating things under various topics. Mm -hmm. So I think, like, when I was writing the book and writing the album at the same time, um, a lot of the themes overlap, um, and it's just yeah a way of like putting things in order for me. 
So the album is about putting sound documents that you have been, you know, documenting during your travels. And the book is about also organizing your thoughts that you have trans translated into paper, or at, at least a screen like this? Yeah, I mean, I think like a lot of the writing was, you know, just like notes and poems and scribbles and little stories that I'd written probably in the last like 10 years or something. Mm. Um, and I finally just kind of had like a reason or a medium to kind of put them together because I feel like they're all interlinked topics in a broad sense. Um, yeah, so it just kind of came together like, like that. Um, whereas the music, it wasn't meant to be like a diaristic kind of music yeah. uh, documentation as such. It was just my first album and it just happened to contain all these sounds. So before we talk about the music side, let's talk a, a little bit about the writing side because I'm a writer myself. I mean, I write for a living myself. Um, and, and that process of putting, you know, thoughts into words uh, interests me a lot. So, when would you find yourself in need of putting your thoughts down? Uh, give us a couple of examples. Um, all the time. Like, I mean, I think, I think, um, for example, things like. Uh, sleep phenomena and okay. dreams really interest me. So often, you know, I wake up in the middle of the night and I might write something down that was a dream. Well, uh, what do you use your, your, your phone? Yeah, I just use my notes on my phone. Okay. Just write them down. So there's a lot of stuff that doesn't really make that much sense sometimes in the morning, but I try and make sense of them or like make it up. That, that, that's amazing. So you are documenting your dreams. Yeah. You know the value of that. It's 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 like. At least now we don't have the technology to put a camera on our dreams and to record our dreams. But when the moment we wake up and we do that, it's really important, isn't it? And when you go back to those notes, what are your feelings when we are reading about just dreamed about ducks? Whatever. <laughs> um, I think sometimes I'm like, like what? But then also a lot of the time, to be honest, I'm like, that's really disturbing, or like that's weird. Like, what's wrong with my brain? Like, you know, sometimes I feel like it's your brain comes off a lot more stuff than your waking self can really imagine. Do do, do you uh, concede into trying to, you know? Um, psychologically interpret those notes? Like, what does this really mean? I think I used to. I mean, I studied psychology and I was very interested in, like, analyzing dreams in that sense. But I think, really, at the end of the day, I don't believe it has that much meaning or correlation. It's just fun, kind of, to try and, like, work out your own brain sometimes. And it's just a nice source of, like, I mean, some of my dreams are like so memorable, they're as strong as real memories. And I think that's kind of, it's like having, it's like making a film, but in your it head is. and like living it um, in a lot of senses that you couldn't in real life. So I think that's, you know, like sometimes I have, I've had dreams where it's like, I have three bodies or wow. I'm a thumb or, like, <laughs> just like really random stuff that you couldn't do in real life. So it's kind of like you know, interesting. Um, most of my uh, writing assignments are very common stuff that I, I just get up and, you know, <clears throat> I will have my breakfast and do them. But every once in a while, I get this very important writing assignment and that worries me because you know I have a deadline to deliver it and that makes me think a lot about it usually I dream about it 
and it has literally happened to me that I have like this 2,000 word assignment that I have to deliver the next day. And I wake up this morning before, just before the delivery date with, in, with those 2,000 words in my head and I just have to, you know, channel them into, into the iPad or whatever. And it's really, and I'm always amazing, like, my fingers are writing automatically. Does that happen to you? Um, maybe not with, not, with, not with writing, but maybe with music. Maybe music yeah. yeah. Well, like, yeah, certain things come to you that only happen in your sleep or in your dream. Like, you know, I think for a lot of people, like, people who are scientists, like, you know, they made a lot of important discoveries in their dreams, right? Like, it helps them. Very curious right now, your creativity, when does it manifest when it comes to, to the clock? Very early morning, late at night, you know, you have those creators that only work after the sun goes down. What is it like for you? I generally hate the daytime, so I think the it's the nighttime okay. that I work best when it feels very quiet or like that everyone's gone to sleep. Okay. It just feels tranquil. So the night is a better counselor to your creativity. Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. So um, you had many different jobs, editor at a magazine. I wish I could have done that. Um, music director at a hotel. I wish I could have done that also. Um, that's, you know, that steady income must be something hard to let go of especially on this day and time, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I've always... Well, I never really planned on being like an artist or a musician, so it's kind of like I always want to have a job whilst I do creative projects. So I think it's important to have that separation so that it's not like all of your energy... Or it's not that all of your creative energy is going into something that's supposed to make all of your income as well. I just find that like at mm. odds with each other. You know, writing about music and you have worked at this amazing magazine that uh, I had a couple of dreams about also called Based. Um, how was it? Um, you know, just to give your perspective and in, in, into other people's work. Um, I mean... Do you have respect for what other people now write about your own work because of that? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think like it's interesting because, you know, with, with films or music or art, like, obviously, a lot of it is open to interpretation and that's what's interesting, right? It's like about what individuals um, subjectively view or how they experience a work. It might not necessarily just be about the intention of the artist. Um, so I think like when I was reviewing and interviewing a lot of people that I was really admiring, like, it, you know, being at Dave was my first job and I was very like, um, I was very excited to meet a lot of people that, you know, made really inspiring work to me. Um, and actually, yeah, the first time I ever came to Semi Brief was 10 years ago for the first one mm -hmm. um, as a journalist. And then okay, okay. And I came back <laughs> three okay. times, I think. So it's actually always been really nice, kind of like, um, well, to come so back. So you change the hats? Yeah, it's yeah. Kind, of kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I know this is kind of sideways to the main thing, but tell me about that Hong Kong hotel gig. Uh, w w what did you have to do there? Um, so I moved. I moved to Hong Kong like just after I quit Dazed, after four years, and I wanted to just have a new experience. Um, but I didn't really have a background in uh, hospitality or anything. But they were looking for a music director. Um, what, what does that mean, being a musical director at a hotel? Did, did you have gigs or...? Yeah, yeah okay. so we had three venues. So we had like a 3,000 capacity venue, 600 Whoa. capacity and 400 capacity um, on a rooftop pool. 
Um, and so it was my job to kind of um, basically build the reputation of the hotel um, in Hong Kong as a cultural hub, basically. So it was like working with fashion brands or looking, working with like Art Basel or working with um, local like record labels and uh, promoters to do parties there. Um, and also build like a resident DJ team and also book international artists. Okay. So it was, um, it was quite tough because Hong Kong is not really somewhere where a lot of people happen to be. So, you know, you might catch some artists while they're on tour to Australia or to, uh, to Tokyo or like, you know, we did a lot of like flight shares with people in Seoul and in Shanghai and Beijing. Um, so, I mean, like financially it was quite difficult, but at the same time, like this was a five star hotel. And I mean, it's, it's W Hotel, which is like from New York. Mm. Um, they have like hundreds of hotels all over the world. So they have a lot of budget. So it was quite like crazy to like be able to do these things. Like we'd have um, a partnership with um, like some local festivals there who have, I don't know, they had really weird kind of lineups. They had like Tenacious D and <laughs> okay. like, um, I don't know, like just like really like big bands from a certain era, like a lot of like, Ed Banger stuff, like Boys Noise and things like this. Basically, I feel like in Asia, like a lot of stuff is about 10 years too late. So it's kind of like, yeah, it takes okay. a bit of time for like music to, to kind of I was going build. to ask you if there was also a political dimension to your programming, because as anyone who has watched the news over the last, I would say, five years, uh, we have learned about how Hong Kong has been a place of resistance. So I'm guessing that also translated even into a five-star hotel programming. Um, were you conscious of that when you were booking this name instead of another name? I think, so basically when the Umbrella Revolution happened in 2014, that was my last year and I actually was leaving Hong Kong then, partially because of that and I felt very, um, kind of like I lost a bit of hope in the, mm. you know, a lot of, like we would go to a lot of the protests, um, but you know, a lot of arrests were being made. It was really violent. Um, and Hong Kong is generally, like before is known as being a very, very safe place. Like you can leave your laptop in a cafe and walk off and it's fine. And like you can walk in an alleyway by yourself at 3 a.m. and it's fine. And this was kind of the first time when there was like a huge tension in the city and it felt really uncomfortable and not safe anymore. There was a lot of, um, there's a lot of talks that basically like, the police were collaborating with local triads and like gangs to basically um, wow. meddle with protesters and do things kind of like off the record. Um, and, but you know, that stuff was quite difficult because it's like, you know, my political beliefs lie with Hong Kong where, you know, my mom is from. But, you know, even during that time, my mom had come back to Hong Kong to visit me while I was living there for a year. And she was kind of on the side of China. And um, I feel like some of the older generation, or like certain people are, you know, they believe that it should go back to China politically. Mm. And that, uh, you know, the colony was the UK was not a good time. Um, I never lived there during that time. So I can't really say for sure, but I think it's more about the independence of the country rather than about who should, what other country should own of Hong course. Kong, right? So I think, I mean, during that time, like, as a very, very corporate company that I was working for, they, they didn't explicitly say anything about doing, not doing things that are political, um, but also it would feel very jarring to try and do something that is very kind of like anti-establishment in a five-star hotel of course. while you're drinking like a 10 pound bottle of water. Like it just didn't, it was really not great. So I left, really. <laughs> Obviously, and now you are here. And yeah, if I didn't leave, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, be making music and doing the things I really wanted to, I think. So how was it yesterday? Let's talk about yesterday, yeah. Uh, yeah, yesterday was really intense and it was, yeah, it was quite like, um, it did feel quite meditative, um, 
but also pretty draining by the end of it. I think I was kind of like starting to be a bit out of it, kind of like towards the end. And I was only supposed to play live at the beginning, at the end for like 45 minutes each. But it felt really weird to just kind of like leave in the middle and walk away. So I kind of just kept coming back and... Um, so you, you ran the marathon? Yeah. <laughs> You just a did the marathon. marathon. You know, um, I'm guessing that for someone that, has, well, that was educated in the Christian faith, um, presenting your work at a chapel must hold a special meaning. Um, I mean, I think that's in a very loose sense. Like when I grew up, um, I, like most schools in England, they, a lot of them are generally like tied to a church. So I went to a Church of England school. Mm -hmm. But, you know, my school was like maybe 80% Muslim students. Okay. So it wasn't really like any of us really believed it. It's just that we went to church because we had to. And I think um, for certain reasons, like for me to get into another school, I had to prove that I went to church. Okay. So I started going from quite a young age. Um, on Sundays and like, you know, and I think I did believe it a little bit because I, you know, like, obviously I won't go into details, but I feel like my childhood was a little bit of a crazy time. And maybe certain things like that grounded me a bit. Mm. Um, but I wouldn't say I'm, I'm not like Christian or anything, so. Okay, <laughs> so uh, how, how did you approach the, the the site-specific side of uh, your presentation uh, yesterday. I'm, I'm guessing that before doing the work, you were shown, what, photographs, films of, of the place? Yeah. What were your first impressions? I mean, okay, so, but then obviously, like, a lot of my work, like Holy Palm and Liturgy and um, a lot of my music, like, samples, certain kind of religious undertones and things like that, make mm -hmm. a lot of references to religion and spirituality. Um, so obviously I thought that was a really fitting kind of <coughs> space for that, um, because even if I don't, you know, I, I, don't, um, I don't feel like super indoctrinated within one religion, I still feel that those spaces, you know, to anyone instills a sense of, um, or, or, like, it's just quite a moving place to be in, even if there's not any music playing. Um, but, yeah, I feel very privileged to, to be able to do it there. It, it, obviously, you have recorded sound in different sacred places during your travel through the world. Um, and these recordings must, um, I know, I, I haven't done that, but um, I'm guessing that it, when you listen back to those recordings, you listen more to, than, than just the sound that is documented there? I mean, is there a, a spiritual dimension to those recordings? In a sense, yes, but I think a lot of it also makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable um, or a little bit be, because also I feel a little bit like am I crossing a line of sorts um, you, you feel like you are invading this secret space or something like that um, not invading but I, I feel like maybe I'm taking something from it okay um, and also because you know for example like a lot of like churches or sacred spaces don't allow like video or like you know camera with and things like that and in those places I respect that and I won't do that but you know in in a lot of like temples and places that I've been to like you know they're very open to that but even so like if I'm recording monks chanting or and then putting it together with something from the other side of the world like is, is that a little bit sacrilegious? Like, is that a little bit offensive to people? Like, I'm trying to be careful about, like, the kind mm. of cultural layer to it. But at the same time, like, I think a lot of it is done with respect and 
um, also like belief within these systems. So you you, you are basically talking about the ethics of uh, the recording um, of these situations. You know, the archaeologists will say that the only thing that it will take to change the object of my observation is to point a camera at it. Um, so you feel like when you press the recording button, you are changing something about you know, the situation that you are trying to, in some way, preserve through sound? Some, sometimes I do feel like that. Um, but I definitely think that's, for me, that's more of a visual thing. I feel like if you record something on, on video, I don't know why, it's just a personal take on it, I guess. But I feel like that um, changes the object that is yeah. being viewed as such. Um, yeah, I don't know why. So, for my eternal shame, I was not here yesterday for uh, the presentation of your piece, but um, I've been re reading about it, um, and I know that uh, Mishima has inspired you to write the piece. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, so I mean, the, the piece yesterday, um, I just, I generally like to like, conceptualize um, certain projects for like these site-specific kind of shows. Um, or even just like releases. Like I never just like to do a release and it's like, here's some music. It's like, um, I generally want to have some meaning behind it or like, you know, have different kind of inspirational um, topics. Um, so yeah, the one yesterday was based around Sea of Fertility, which is the name of the tetralogy by Yukio Mishima, um, which was a series of books that he basically said that he would uh, commit suicide upon completion. And he did, he, he committed suicide. He was honest about it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, super messed up. Um, but yeah, like he stabbed himself in the belly with a samurai sword. Um, and, which is like super intense, like I think, obviously, um, but like, I think the name Sea of Fertility, I thought was such a beautiful name. Um, and it basically, it all relates to the different seas and craters that were on the moon. So there's like a sea of crisis and sea of forgetfulness and things like that, uh, which were named, I think, by an Italian um, scientist slash philosopher way back when. Um, and so like, yeah, I think that was the kind of theme that I was running with with the quadraphonic system because I was trying to kind of have the directional sound as being based kind of like loosely as like north, south, east, west, kind of like okay. cardinally um, to kind of map geographically with the spaces of this of the moon. Wow. Maybe. Obviously, that's not really going to like come out in the thing, but it's just I like to have the idea before I make something like. Okay, so. Like I've just confessed, um, I was not there yesterday, but probably some of you guys were there. So if anyone has a question, now is the perfect time to raise your arm and just introduce your question or opinion or you know, comment. The artist is here. It's an incredible opportunity. Please grab it. Yeah, so there's a question there. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. There, there, <laughs> there was a lot of stuff that... Good ears. Yeah, like, um, that are kind of like... Because you can hear a little bit of vocals and things like that, and they're all just like super, super time-stretched, basically. 
because I mean it's a three hour piece so I was like okay how do I how do I make this really long <laughs> <laughs> more questions go ahead don't be shy Okay, so three hours long, the marathon, and um, we are, have all read about, you know, how the marathonist feels about when he crosses that finish line. How were your feelings yesterday when you crossed that finish line? <clears throat> um. It felt pretty good. I think, to be honest, I was kind of more stressed about the talk today. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. Um, I was stressed about the talk today. Yeah, so I think after this, it will feel like the finish line. Because I think the last month has been really intense. Because, um, you know, after a year and a half of like not very much happening in terms of shows, like everything happens this month. Um, so I played like basically all my favorite festivals in this month. Um, and I was also doing a residency in a small town outside of Rome for a month, and mm -hmm. so it was literally I've just, it's been quite intense, so now I'm like... After dreaming tonight about the performance last night, did you take any notes this morning? I don't know what I dreamt about I'm this morning. I'm <laughs> being really invasive no about, yeah, I'm sorry, just yeah. curious. I mean, how did you process something like, you know, I'm, I'm going back to that uh, marathon um, comparison, what, uh, uh, this, um, metaphor, uh, metaphor, yeah? Uh, but waking up this morning, you must have felt like, okay, it's done, it's behind me, how was your feeling about that? I don't know. Again, to be honest, I don't, I don't really think about stuff in the past so much in that sense. If I've like done something, I just I keep thinking about all oh, the other stuff I have to do. Okay, so if there are no more questions, I'll let finally the journalist in me take over and just ask you what's next? on your agenda. Um, you had the record last year, the book this year. What will 2022 bring? Um, I also just released an EP, uh, which is kind of coming out this month slash next month, um, which is also kind of based off field recordings, but that was like a specific project that the label asked okay. me to do off those. Um, and aside from that, um, I'm hopefully going to put the content that I made from this residency in Rome um, to to be a cassette release with these physical paper talismans that I made okay. during the installation. Um, so I'm just trying to work on And that should it. be coming out soon? That one, maybe will take a little bit longer because okay. I'm trying to work <laughs> on the visual side of it as well. So which is something that I'd okay. like to do. Okay, so. and I completely forgot about that. I had these notes here, but you know, our conversations are. Um, just to end, tell me about the technical side of your field recording. Or what, what do you use to record these impressions on your journeys, you know, when you go into a temple? Are you using your phone or any special Devices? I use my iPhone. Okay. And I think a lot of, I just, that's why I don't see myself as a field recordist. Like, you know, I use my phone. Um, and then often I have like a Zoom, and actually I was using Andre, who just asked me the question, his Tascam <laughs> for this um, <laughs> Wales project uh, for field recordings, um, as well as like a few kind of contact mics and. Uh, a hydrophone, and there was a geophone and such. Um, wow. But, you know, you're not always carrying these things with you when you're like, when you want to record something. And also, I'm not really like out there trying to record birds. I'm like trying to kind of like record some weird music I hear on a radio somewhere, which probably the fidelity doesn't, you know, need. 
that anyway. So you know these concepts of field rec recording feel so weird to some of us, but we have all been doing that. When we are at this family dinner and someone is singing happy birthday, we are doing a field recording, actually, aren't we? Yeah, it's just a fancy way of saying recording. <laughs> okay, so last opportunity, is there? Okay, there's a question there. I think it'd be nicer if it was, you know, like I think it was very much, you know, to, for that space and for that time and that's it. And it's not going to be, I'm just going to delete the file and that's it. Delete the file? Yeah, delete the project. Oh man. <laughs> so I hope you're there. <laughs> delete the file. Please don't delete the file. Release the file. Um, okay. Any other question? Another one there? Mm, that's an interesting question, yeah. I mean, to be honest, like, very, it's just on a very basic level, it's just like, oh, sometimes like, I'm walking in Westfield and I'll hear a song playing in a shop and I'm like, that's a banger. So I want to <laughs> record it. I mean, like, just so I can, like, lay, because I don't have Shazam, so it's just like, oh, I can go and find it, like, somehow. Um, or, if it's like more of a nature thing, it's just like, oh, this is like a bird. I, okay, I, I said I wasn't going to record birds, but if I do record a bird, it's like, oh, I've never heard this bird before. Or like, I don't know, it's just like certain things are like, or, you know, construction sites, that's a very, very cliche field recording thing. But sometimes construction sites sound really good, so that's it, really. <laughs> Um, I think maybe it's just something that's always been with me, and it's not really something that's like conscious, but it happens, and that's kind of what rituals are for people, right? In yeah. a sense. Anyone else? So, I think it's time for us all to thank you for your generosity in sharing all of this information and insight into your own work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. No need to be nervous. <laughs> this is um, finished. And thank you all for being here and all of your attention. Thank you. Thank you.